All right, Luke chapter 5, the call of several disciples and some miracles. Um, Randy, uh, last class in Luke chapter 4, took us through a study of the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And of course, before Jesus could start, what had to happen made evident uh, by the language that this was God's will that he would go through this. In the wilderness, what did Jesus have to do? Be tempted and overcome Satan, all right? Um, that that really fits uh, if uh, there's a universal problem of sin, it's a spiritual problem, and that needs to be taken care of. Someone needs to be sent to take care of that. Who do you sin? Someone who is a part of the problem or someone who has conquered uh, the problem? And so that's kind of setting him up for his ministry. And then what, after he leaves, specifically I'm referring to verses 14 and 15 in chapter 4, what's he doing? A lot of, and there's more than one answer to that. It's his ministry. What does his ministry include? Preaching, healing, miracles. So do those go together? Aaron? I think the idea that we see after the wilderness is him serving his father. And he does that so that in, in, in my opinion, if you look at Luke chapter 5, is that's exactly what he's going to ask them now to do. Mm-hmm. Is for them to serve. Yeah. Ultimately him, but ultimately serve the father. Serve the father through him. Yeah, that's a great point. He, he's serving the Father. He's about his Father's business, just like we read in chapter 2 when he was 12. That's the way he described it. And his Father's business is, chapter 19, verse 10, for him to seek and save that which is lost, right? And so, a bunch of miracles, right? Always in the context of preaching. Because, as we've recently studied in, in another uh, sermon, miracles confirm the message he's preaching. Uh, Notice in verse uh, 15 of chapter 4, he taught in their synagogues being glorified by all. And were the miracles the only impressive thing he was doing? Were they impressed by his teaching on its face? Without even the miracles accompanying them, was his teaching impressive to them? Yeah, notice in chapter 4 as well in verse 22, all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words that proceeded out of his mouth. Now, as he's making these claims there in Nazareth, they're like, wait a second, but aren't you Joseph's son? So they got some problems to deal with. But the words have merit on their own, okay? I want us to remember that uh, because when we get into chapter 5, it's not just random miracles. Remember, how is Luke attacking the record of his gospel? What did it say at the beginning in the, the prologue, if you will, the introduction of Luke's gospel? How does he describe his gospel? What was that? An accurate account, an orderly account. And we we mentioned that a lot of it is chronological, some of it's not. Um, But it is orderly. It's logical. It it proceeds in a connected fashion. And I think that's what we're going to see here in chapter 5, but it's it's been building up, hasn't it? Um, Even even in the prophecy of Gabriel to, to Elizabeth, but also... Um, to Mary, and then also to uh, the the angel to the you know the uh, the shepherds, and also um, Simeon uh, and uh, and uh, Anna, and all of these people that were we've been studying about John's ministry that Tyler took us through, and the fact that you know he's that voice of the one preparing the way of the Lord. But remember in verse six of chapter three when he's quoting from Isaiah, Isaiah. His record goes on to say, and all flesh shall see what? Salvation of God. And so we're, we're seeing him preach the kingdom. He's verifying his message with miracles. And it, that's always emphasized. The miracles are important. His compassion is emphasized, especially in Luke. We talked about that in the introduction. But it's always overwhelmed by the compassion he has for lost souls. He's coming to seek and save that which is lost. And you notice at the end of chapter 4, what is it? left with? What is his focus? What does he have to do, he says? 
the kingdom of God. That's the first time Luke mentions that phrase, kingdom of God. Now, what you're going to see at the end of chapter 5, and I think this is important because all, all of these are going to line up, and hopefully uh, I can help us uh, see that a little bit. Um, but the hardest part of chapter 5 probably is verses 33 through the end of the chapter. Um, but it's a pretty simple concept. And what we're seeing here ultimately is a contrast between people accepting what Jesus is offering and they are rejoicing. This is good. This is a fulfillment, as he said, of, of Isaiah's prophecy, Isaiah 61. He, he says in uh, chapter 4 and verses 18 and 19, he reads that, that this is him um, being anointed to preach the gospel, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives, to recover the sight of the blind, and liberty, set at liberty to those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. This, this is being fulfilled in your hearing. That's his purpose. This is a joyous occasion. This is what the Jews have always been looking toward, or should have. Now, the Pharisees, they're missing the whole point. And John makes that clear in his gospel in chapter 5 when Jesus is saying that you search the scriptures because you think you have life in them, but they're the ones that testify of me, but you don't come to me. Uh, you don't believe in me. You don't believe what Moses is writing about me. And so they're missing the point, and that's how we're going to kind of see this, a contrast between them being so narrow-minded we're going to talk about fasting a little bit, especially as it pertains, I think, in context to some of their um, views of their traditions in contrast to you know, what we would understand the law would actually require. They're so narrow-minded uh, about and, and arrogant about their, their position and their traditions and just the old ways that they are rejecting what's right in front of them, which was the whole focus of everything that preceded this. And uh, that's going to be a contrast you see. You see uh, these disciples being called, and they'll eventually be called to apostleship specifically, but they're being called. They go with joy. They leave everything. A leper is cleansed, and, and while Jesus commanded him, don't say anything about this, he can't help it. And that doesn't justify his disobeying Jesus, but he can't help it. He tells everyone. He's overjoyed. And then this paralytic, um, he's, he's told to be a good cheer in Matthew's gospel. His sins are forgiven them, and they rejoice and glorify God about this. Matthew, or Levi, as Luke's gospel um, names him, is, is called, and he leaves all to follow him, and then he throws a feast for Jesus. I mean, you're talking about overwhelming joy, and then the Pharisees kind of put a damper on it. Why aren't your disciples fasting? See that? Why would they have that mindset? Why would you fast in a joyful occasion? And we're going to make a connection to... Uh, Isaiah 61 again in, in that regard. But I just want us to see that big picture before we get into the details. Any comments or questions about this? All right. Uh, so first section, verses 1 through 11, is um, you know, taking from, I believe, the King James Version dropped. I had to, I had to go, Merriam-Webster, how do you pronounce that? Dropped. And it's just a catch. It's... It's a, a draft of fish, and so that's what it's talking about. You're probably smarter than me and already knew that. Um, so uh, the draft of fish and then the call of, of the disciples. Let me get ahead of this so that I don't forget to click advance. Um, so what's Jesus doing in the first few verses? Preaching. So he's at the lake called Genesaret, which is what? Sea of Galilee. Gennesaret is, uh, according to Thayer, he says, a very lovely and fertile region on the Sea of Galilee. What's he using as a pulpit? He's using a boat. Uh, and I think, you know, very minor detail. Kind of shows Jesus' down-to-earth humility nature. He's a man of the people. He's one to teach everybody. He doesn't just need a synagogue. He can preach sitting in a boat on a lake. Um, who's also there? Besides the crowd, obviously. The crowd, in fact, is pushing so close into him that he has to set out from a boat, uh, from the shore on a boat to preach. But who's, who's also there that is of note? Simon, who's also called Peter later, and then James and John, who are brothers of Zebedee. And so uh, you've got those men who are obviously going to be called uh, to be apostles and such. And that's really a focus here, but all the people are going to experience this. So Jesus is preaching. What does he do when he stops preaching? Yeah. 
launch out into the deep, let down your net for a catch. Doesn't sound like much, but what's the context? What does Peter mention? He's been fishing all day. That's a great point, Carl. He's an expert. He's a professional fisherman. Um, so, you know, before someone says, you know, well, what's the big deal about catching some fish in a lake that has fish? Well, these are professional fishermen that have been fishing all night. That's when you catch the most fish, haven't caught anything. And this man who is a carpenter, carpenter's son, is telling them what to do. Nothing special about it. Just launch out in the deep and throw your nets in. And they, they catch this fish. So, miracle. It's very impressive. And obviously to the degree that uh, what happens to the boat? It's overwhelmed. Yeah, it's overwhelmed. It starts to sink. And so that's something we're going to see throughout this too. The nature of miracles. It's always obvious. It's always overwhelming. There's no question about it. It's not someone that claims to have a you know spiral fracture, hairline fracture in their shin and you know, they're limping up to the stage and the faith healer says you're healed and then they sprint out the door. That's not what this is. Miracles are immediate, they're obvious, and it's, it's overwhelming that it is indeed a suspension of the laws of nature. So Simon, what does he call Jesus? That's significant. Master. What, what would that tell us about Simon's perception of this? And of Jesus. And why would he have that perception? Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, pre preaching preceded this request or demand, and he believed what Jesus was saying, and he spoke as one who has authority. Is this the first encounter that Simon has had with Jesus of an impressive nature? What did we study about in chapter 4 pertaining to Simon? His mother-in-law was healed. Um, so this is not the first encounter in fact, if you look at John's gospel after John the Baptist, you know, sees the Spirit descend on him and he sends two of his disciples to Jesus and then they go find Peter. There's, there's interactions that precede this and it's, it's to be implied there with even Matthew as well. These, these men aren't just ignorant people that are just, you know, foolish guys following some random guy that they have no idea who he could be. There's evidence. Faith is evidence-based. It's not a blind leap. It involves not sight, but proof that verifies what we should be doing, but it's not completely blind. There's evidence here. And so he says, Master, and that's a, that's a broader term than teacher or rabbi. It's, it's further encompassing of his authority. It means a chief commander or overseer or master. Uh, Vine says it's used by the disciples in addressing the Lord in recognition of his authority rather than his instruction. It's not necessarily separate from the authority in his instruction, but it's just general. He's master, period. And then what does he say? I know we've been fishing all night. It's not happened, but... Yeah, we'll do it anyway. Nevertheless, at your word. Remember in chapter 4 and verse 36, he had healed a man who was demon-possessed, and it says that the people said, What a word is this? For with, what? Authority and power. And so they recognized the authority in Jesus' words. And he said, since you got authority, you're master. You know, I don't really get why you're telling me to do this, because it seems vain to me, because I've been trying all day, and I'm a fisherman, I know what I'm talking about. But you said it, I'll do it. What's an application from that? Nevertheless, that's your word. I will do. We don't have to understand it. We don't have to comprehend it. We, Jesus said it. We do it without questioning it. Now, we're going to grow in comprehension, no doubt. But that should that's faith. Nevertheless, at your word, I will do it. Sherry? Well, he does have the faith. He just has, but it, it, it's, it's twofold. It's not acting with it. I'm, yes. I'm just demonstrating my faith in you because here I am. I'm going to cast those nets out. Yeah. He, that's a great point because he, he could have said, you know, I've tried all night. I believe you, but I'm just going to sit tight, you know. I'll let, I'll let James or John do it or whatever. He, told, he put Simon into action. There's 
another comment that I read throughout this, just kind of a side comment, that essentially said that what Jesus does here is significant in, in many ways. And one of the ways is because he's doing this work. This is his ministry but he is involving others in it. You want to strengthen faith and ability, you get the disciples involved. And that's what he's doing here. Jesus could have said, hey, watch this guy's thrown out the net. I'm a carpenter and I'm fishing. Look at all the fish I caught. Is it Jesus' miracle or Simon's? It's Jesus' miracle. Did Simon play any part in it? Yeah. Not, not in the miraculous part of it, but he did something. You know, he had faith and works. But it was still the grace of God that provided this uh, provision of fish and, and proof of his deity. So verse 8. Someone read verse 8. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. All right, so... Why did he react that way? Thank you for reading that story. What sin? <coughs> Apart from me, Lord, what? Okay, certainly. I mean, he sees this is significant, but why depart from me? Yes. That's a great point. That that takes humility. It understands the gravity of, of sin and therefore the, the holiness of deity that he makes that connection. You can also contrast that with the Pharisees' attitude because when they talk about fasting, the implication is, you know, you know you're supposed to be righteous. You're supposed to be leading your disciples in righteousness, and they're not even doing these things that show you're a righteous person. And so there's arrogance there. But here's, a, here's an interesting contrast to that. While there is the acknowledgment of sin— of glory of deity and holiness and unworthiness. There's also, by God's grace, the invitation into his presence, which means you're not worthy, and without my forgiveness, you would not be able to be anywhere close to me. But this was the whole point. This was the focus of the prophecies. This is the point of the Messiah to come to bring people into a close proximity to God through forgiveness and a transformation. And so it's not about, uh, you know, even understand how terrible you are and get away, but Jesus is inviting him into this ministry and, and fellowship. And so there's, there's great points there. Um, reminded me of Isaiah 6. What, what did Isaiah do in the throne room scene when it's, you know, showing his ministry and his call to that? Sees the throne and the train of his robe filled the temple and the the cherubim there, holy, 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 and what did he say? Yeah, I'm a man of unclean lips. He said, woe is me. And then took a coal from the altar and he purified it. Um, but that's kind of, I think, what's going through Peter's mind here. And, and that's a great point that he's been hearing this teaching and now you have this confirmation. I mean, this is not just some good teaching, but this is teaching from God. And, uh, and uh, John points out in John chapter 6 that that's essentially what Isaiah prophesied about as well. They will all be taught by God. And not just God through a prophet, but God in the flesh teaching them. And they're making these connections. They're not all the way there yet, by no means, but they're certainly making connections. All right, uh, question number one. The miraculous uh, draft of fish was a visible demonstration to the apostles. What should they have learned from it? Yeah, it should have provoked them to. And, then, but, and God, Jesus will provide. Jesus will provide. And what I'm getting out of that too is when he, they brought all those fish up, it's showing, and if you look at it now, it's showing how many men, unlimited amount of people that we can catch if we go out and preach the gospel. Yeah, absolutely. We're doing exactly what God tells us to do. Let's go out there and, and do our full fishing, if you will. Yeah. And bring them in. That's an excellent point. It's uh, direction I was thinking of too. 
Yeah, that's a great point. Combining those two things together that y'all are talking about, uh, you think of his provision, but also the expectation and how daunting that can be. But then that with God, all things are possible. That's essentially all being wrapped up in that. And I want us to notice they were astonished, certainly. And he said, do not be afraid. So here's this. First comes humility, uh, unworthiness, a littleness of your the percep- perception of yourself and Sorrow for sin, intense grief for the things that you've done, that's necessary. And God wants us to feel that way. But to what end? That we can be released from it and we can be joyous and we can get to work. So he says, do not be afraid. Depart from me. And then he says, do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. They brought their boats to the land. They forsook all and followed him. So I want us to notice the connection there. It says, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And he did it, and there was a miraculous catch. Jesus provided, like y'all were talking about, he provided miraculously. He provided the impossible. But Peter had a part to play in that, didn't he? Now he's saying, from now on you will catch men. That's not an accident. Jesus was intentional using this situation. Is their task going to be difficult in preaching the gospel? Yeah. Will they be rejected a lot? Yes. Yes. But with God's wisdom and the power in his gospel, what will they accomplish? Salvation of many souls, bringing glory to God. That's always important for us to remember. It's a parallel to what Paul says, that I planted, Apollos watered, God gave the increase. You know, we just throw out our nets and we're going to catch fish because God has the power. We throw out the seed and there's going to be fruit. It's going to sprout. It's because God gives the increase. Sometimes we think too much about it. Instead, we should study our Bibles to know the truth and then give it to others. Um, all right, let's, let's move on. They left all and followed him. And then you get to the next miracle um, that is provided for us in this record. What kind of a man comes to Jesus and what does he request? A leper. And he wants healing, obviously. But it's interesting that that Luke says that he was full of leprosy. The other synoptics don't report that. They just say a leper came. Um, The New American Standard Bible says covered. Maybe this is Luke's physician uh, um, uh, profession coming out. And and also like in chapter 4 that she was sick with a high fever. He recognizes the severity of this leprosy. It's reached an advanced stage. And so the leper says... Um, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. We've got a question um, about that, I believe. Yes, question five. What characteristics did this miracle manifest that would make it distinct of those of today's faith dealers? Nope, that's not it. Um, what shows the faith of the leper whom Jesus healed? Question three. What what words did he say that showed his faith? Huh? You're willing, you can heal me. Yeah. Yeah, you can. In fact, not just the you can part of it, but if you're willing. In other words, the only thing that's going to keep you from being able to do it is you don't want to do it. <laughs> I mean, a man in authority, you know, he doesn't answer to anyone. You know, he can, you know, obviously there are tears of authority. But the point is he knew he had some kind of authority and you can do this. And again, this isn't ignorance. This is his fame has been spreading throughout the land. And so he put out his hand and touched him saying, I am willing to be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him. And then he charged him, don't tell anyone. What did he tell him to do instead? Go to the priest. Why would he go to the priest? Yeah. And they are gonna have to meet, but to me it just was that quick, he's not gonna have to do it because they probably knew this guy anyway. Mm-hmm. He was in that from that region at least. Yeah. So 
it, it's going to be an instantaneous, oh, you're in here too. Yeah, and they, I mean, they'd have to go through the process. So if you go back and, and read that, some of it is, is checking. So if you see the sore and it's this way, then you do this, send them out. Seven days later, check on it again. If it's advanced, you know it's leprosy, put them out of the city. You know, if it's getting better, do this again. And it's getting a little better, do this again. And then finally, it's obvious it's not leprous. And so then you go through the purification ritual, and he's, he's set to go. Because how would they deal with lepers, according to the law of Moses? Isolate, Isolate them, because this is pretty contagious, isn't it? Outside of the city, they were very lonely. In fact, there's an account of this in regard to um, some lepers in Israelite history who uh, happened upon the camp that was abandoned. And you remember that story, and they came back and uh, realized they needed to tell the good news. Um, but that's how lepers were dealt with, and then he's cleansed. He would, according just as Moses commanded, there were things that he would have to do. Now think about that too in this context with the Pharisees saying, why aren't they fasting? Why aren't they fasting? And then in chapter 6, why are they plucking heads of grain on the Sabbath? They're doing what is not lawful, were they? No, it was lawful. And that's going to be the argument we see. Some have used that text talk a little bit about situational ethics, but um, Jesus' point is, no, they're not breaking the law. They're breaking your tradition, and you don't like that. And so you contrast that with him saying, do this just as Moses commanded. Jesus, especially in regard to Matthew's record of the Sermon on the Mount, which you know we'll read about in chapter 6, Luke's record, he said, I did not come to destroy the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. He never broke the law. He never, he never said, you know what, because I wrote the law, I don't have to obey this. That's not what he's saying in chapter 6, by the way. He's not saying, because I'm Lord of Sabbath, I don't have to you know, observe the Sabbath. He's saying, I'm Lord of the Sabbath, I actually know what breaks Sabbath law, and that's not it. And so he follows the law of Moses, and that's what he's doing here. But he wants them, him to go there because Moses commanded it, but also for what reason? testimony to them. I believe the ESV says it's a proof to them. That's what he means by that, a testimony to them. But did he hear Jesus in regard to him saying, don't tell anybody? No. He went and told any, everybody anyway, right? And so that attracts more people, and what does Jesus do? Because people are coming out. He withdraws and prays. That should tell us a little bit about prayer for us. If Jesus is doing it, do we need to do it? Uh, Hendrickson says in his commentary, with uh, this withdrawal, it also had a positive purpose, namely to pour out his heart in prayer in order the, that the reservoirs of his body and soul might be replenished from his Father's inexhaustible resources. I love to echo that. That's what prayer is. Even Jesus needed that. And uh, we certainly depend upon it as well. All right. Moving on um, to this next miracle, uh, very familiar to us. I think Jesus is teaching in a house, and there's a big crowd. You can't even get in the door, and that poses a problem to some people. There is a man who is a paralytic, and the, the book points out that the paralytic is born of four, and we see that in Mark's, uh, or I believe in Mark's gospel um, that there were four that were with him. Yes, Mark specifies four men. And so they can't get him into the house, so what do they do? Drop him in through the roof, make a hole in the roof, tiles that could be taken out, so they drop him in through the roof. What does that show about them? Their faith, unwavering faith. What about how they viewed their friend? Great love and care and compassion, right? There's some parallels here that we should be thinking about as well. What, what are we willing to do for those who are lost? How much do we love them? And uh, are we willing to, to uh, you know, go through the roof, <laughs> uh, metaphorically, of course? And so when Jesus saw their faith, what did he say? What, did, what is the first thing he said to them? By the way, their faith, not just his faith, but their faith, all of them. But then he says something about this man who's paralyzed sins are forgiven. What does that tell us about Jesus' mission and focus? It's spiritual. It's spiritual. <clears throat> it's spiritual. <clears throat> Never forget that. In all of these miracles, it is good and proper to stress the compassion of God 
um, and that he does indeed care about the struggle that we go through with various maladies of the flesh. But if Jesus' focus was to take away pain, then we wouldn't have it. Right. His point is to take away sin, and if we by faith understand that and want that, we don't have it. We don't have sin. And that's his power. That's his purpose. And it's fulfilled. Aaron? I think that's what's so very important that you talked about earlier in just chapter 5, verse 13. And go throughout the remainder of the book that would, do we realize and humble ourselves enough to realize? And I get emotional thinking about this. If Jesus has to live and he desires to It's ironic uh, that we can have pride that gets in the way of something like that, right? That's a great point uh, to make. Um, he's, I mean, he's always reaching out. Uh, Isaiah 59 says, my hand is not short that it cannot save, nor my ear heavy that it cannot hear. Your sins have separated me. He's, God has always demonstrated that he's reaching out, and Jesus is, is showing that literally here uh, with these people. Um, so after he says, your sins are forgiven you, how do the Pharisees, by the way, Pharisees and scribes are present. Some even came from Jerusalem. So Jesus is stirring things up, isn't he? And what do they reason within themselves? And that's, that's key. They didn't say this out loud necessarily in Jesus' hearing. But what was their inward reasonings? Yeah, so if that's the case and Jesus is not God in their minds, then what is he guilty of? Blasphemy course that's not true their logic is sound if he is not god he is blaspheming they would never make that claim that they can forgive sins the pharisees of all people wouldn't make that claim um their logic is sound but they're denying all this evidence about them so notice he says what are you reasoning in your hearts that's important there's a there's a miracle in itself it's 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 not you know formalized like these others but that's a miracle he knew what they were thinking and that should have told them something as well. But he says, which is easier to say to you, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise up and walk? Now, essentially what he's saying is, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven you. Now, hold on a bit. That's more impressive to say your sins are forgiven you. It's more bold, but it's easier because you cannot observe that. You can't deny it. If I say I've forgiven you of your sins, how are you going to deny that? You know, I don't have to supply proof. You know, you don't have to believe me, but it's pretty easy for me to say that and say, well, it happened. You don't have to believe me, but it happened. It's pretty hard for me to say, get up, you paralytic, and walk. Because if I say that and it doesn't happen, then I'm proving myself wrong. But if I say that and it does happen, that means I've got the power. And that's Jesus' whole point. Um, so, okay, you deny that. What's easier? Well, yeah, I could just leave it at that, but I'll, I'll take your challenge. And he tells him to get up. Of course, he gets up. And Jesus, notice verse 24. Man, I'm cutting it close. We're going to be going fast in a second. <laughs> that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Then he performed the miracle. The word power there is not the word for miracle. It is exousia, which is the word for authority. Now, I want us to notice, we've looked at this verse already back in chapter 4 and verse 36. After he performed a miracle casting out a demon, they said, For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. Authority there is exousia. That's what the word means, authority. Power is a good word to translate it, but authority is the kind of power. And then that word power is the word for miracle, dunamis. Here, when he says that you may know I have power on earth to forgive sins, he's not saying... That you may know I have the miraculous power. He's saying that you may know I have the authority to forgive sins. And he demonstrates the authority by a miracle, a miraculous power. That should always be something playing in our minds when we're thinking about miracles in God's word. Miracles demonstrate authority. And that's what Jesus is saying here. 
you can know that the sins of that man were forgiven because I have the authority to do that. God alone has the authority to do that because I just did something observable that was of, of a divine origin. Does that make sense? Well, it proves his deity, right? Right, it does. It proves his deity. You know, the only God can forgive sins. I'll show you that I have divine authority. I am God to forgive sins. And, and he shows that by this demonstrable uh, deed. And so that's important. Now, when that happened, all were amazed. This man's glorifying God. They're glorifying God. They fear, perhaps because just like Simon did, they recognize their sinfulness and who was just before them. They say that we have uh, seen strange things. It's interesting that word is where we get our word paradox from. Uh, contradictory things, things that you wouldn't expect. So that's important. Very quickly, um, Levi is called and he follows him. It is to be understood that there were other things that Levi knew this this time uh, Jesus is performing all these miracles. People are hearing about this. Levi is one of them. He leaves all and follows Jesus. And then notice the joy again. He gives a feast for Jesus. Notice also similar to those four men that brought their paralyzed friend in. He calls tax collectors and other people in. Uh, Pharisees say tax collectors and sinners so that they can hear of Jesus and do all these things. And that's when they, they say to Jesus complaining to him. Why do you, or rather, uh, they complained against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus says, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not called, uh, come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. What this is not doing is justifying us hanging out with a bunch of sinners all the time. Um, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, Second Corinthians chapter 6 says. That does not mean that we can't have any association with those who are in the world. 1 Corinthians 5 says, otherwise we need to go out of the world. But when we associate with sinners, we're not in the place of sin. We're not condoning their sin. There's no question in their minds that we don't agree with their sinful activity. And we don't just tolerate and go along to get along, but we call them to repentance. That's what Jesus is doing. That's what it proves. It doesn't prove any kind of leniency. But I want us to notice he says, he mentions the word physician and calls those who are sick, goes to those who are sick. But again, his whole emphasis in his ministry is the spiritual sickness. And so he talks about those who are righteous and sinners. And what that does is Jesus is kind of granting the Pharisees their perspective of themselves. He's, he's not agreeing with it. But the Pharisees don't think they're like these people. They're separated. They think they're better than them. And you remember in John 9 when Jesus heals a lame man, he tells them that if you were blind, then you'd see. But because you see, your sins remain. He's essentially saying you don't have the humility like these guys do. You're no better than they are. They just recognize it, and they come to you. And so that's important. Then they move away from this association then to the fasting and the feasting. And says, why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers? And likewise, those of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. He mentions the bridegroom which is wedding language, which is messianic language. It's language of joy. And he says, when they have the bridegroom with them, essentially it's inappropriate for them to be fasting. This is a time of joy. You see the contrast, all of these people involved with joy, fasting associated primarily with sorrow. In fact, the only fast that was commanded was on the Day of Atonement, and it was an affliction of your soul based on a, a penitence and a sin that was acknowledged that was being atoned for. There is a time for sorrow when the bridegroom is taken away from them. So then he speaks a parable. Luke is the only one that refers to this as a parable. And a parable is throwing something alongside another thing as it pertains to being a parallel, a comparison. Remember what he's comparing is this time of joy, which is associated with the acceptance of this man as being the Messiah, who is forgiving sin, who has the power for salvation. He's the bridegroom. He's that Messiah that's to come. And they're overjoyed about it, contrasted with some who, even though that's the case, are still insisting on these traditions blinding them from the true joy of God's will. And that associated with sorrow as well. And so I don't think that we can ignore this new old contrast. There's a reason why... I'm way behind on this. I'm sorry. There's a reason why he's using a new old contrast with the garment and the wine 
and then the one who's drinking the wine. And I don't believe, you know, I've said before, new law versus old law. I think that's too specific. Here's, here's what I think we see from the entire context. There is the old condition and the old ways, what is set up in place. And what the Pharisees think is they're righteous, they're good, not like these sinners and tax collectors. One of the ways that they demonstrate that, that is by their tradition of fasting twice a day. Chapter 18, parable of the uh, tax collector and the sinner, and that's what you see. And you've got that contrast. What does that do for them? They're still unrighteous. But if you humble yourself and you react like Peter does, accept you're a sinful man, and then accept Jesus' invitation to forg forgiveness, then you can be overjoyed like all of these other people. And so there's a contrast between the new and the old. Here's this old time and condition that's begging for and looking forward to a time of restoration and forgiveness and salvation, which is what Jesus is preaching and demonstrating he has the power to give. But these Pharisees are so prideful and arrogant about their traditions that they're blinded from the very thing in God's will he's providing. And to the extent that he says... No one having drunk old wine immediately desires new, for he says the old is better. The New American Standard Bible says good enough. So, I mean, they're content and complacent when they shouldn't be. And all these other people are thinking, you know, the Pharisees' traditions aren't going to do it. We're, we're lost as we are right now. This man just forgave someone. And he showed he had the power to do that. So you see that contrast. And, and so that's important to see, and we're going to see that going forward as well. They keep harping on tradition in chapter 6 as if they're, they're better, they're right with God because they're holding these traditions fast of the Sabbath, when really what Jesus is saying is that that's not going to save you. I'm here to save you. I'm proclaiming salvation to you, and you can't mix the two and expect to get anything positive. They don't mix. You need to accept me. So really fast. I'm sorry about that. We'll pick up Sunday with Chapter 6.